Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 95. It's the midweek supplemental episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. And I'm Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies like myself and knife junkies like yourself to learn all about knives and knife collecting, our midweek show where we get to uh, dive deep into happenings in the knife world, talk about knife news, other stuff going on. And Bob, uh, one thing we wanted to start the show with before we kind of get into the Knife Life News segment, Mm -hmm. as well as our first tool segment this week, was uh, about a, um, uh, what do you call it, crowdsourcing uh, thing with Bone Daddy Blade Works that we had talked about, uh, I think, at least last week. Yeah, that's right. Uh, a couple of weeks back, we talked about the Bone Daddy Blade Works Axis uh, Hand Axe Knife Multi-Tool. It's a, uh, an unusual multi-tool because it doesn't fold. It is a fixed blade knife uh, that has a number of different handholds with its uh, very unique shape that also um, attaches very handily to uh, some sort of a any sort of improvised haft, and you can turn it into an axe. It's a really cool looking product, and and it seems, you know, just from looking at it, like it would be a great uh, sort of piece of kit to have for survival. Uh, you know, in your car, in your in your bug out bag, or in your in your camping uh, gear. Anyway, uh, Sean Hoyman, he's the head of Bone Daddy Blade, Blade Works. He does this with his wife. It's cool, uh, small family company. Got back in touch with me to let me know that they are fully funded. Uh, actually, they're over fully funded, and there there's still about a week left uh, on their, I believe it's a Kickstarter campaign, uh, to get this uh, axis into production. So that's really good news. Not not every crowdsourcing project uh, gets funded, so it's really great to hear when something does get funded, especially mm-hmm. when it's a small family business, and right. it's such a unique and interesting, different sort of product to bring to the knife market. Right. Now, uh, as you said, uh, not only great uh, because it's a small business, but obviously we're biased because it's a it's a knife world product. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's got to be funded. Hey, and I'm sure just because they're overly funded uh, doesn't mean that you can't still hop on the, the Kickstarter campaign for, uh, like said Bob said, just for the, the next few days and while it's still open. So uh, definitely check that out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, go from uh, good to bad, maybe, or seemingly getting worse or uh, just real yeah <laughs> coronavirus covid19 got to talk about that a little bit this past thursday on thursday night knives one of the uh, show topics was should blade show be canceled and um i would i would say about half and half bob the the yeah. folks that were watching at least live haven't yeah. looked through the uh, replay comments but uh, you know about half and half were like no it should not be canceled and about 50% were saying yes it should be canceled you know i think uh, maybe it might divide down the uh, you know we all we all make decisions first and foremost and on how they affect us uh, i myself am am in my late middle 40s i'm edging towards uh you know i'm edging my way through uh middle age and i have children and i have elderly well i have robustly senior parents Mm. and uh, in-laws and i don't want to you know i don't want to bring anything to them right Uh, you know even though i'm so excited about this being my first blade show you know uh uh, discretion well no no that's not the right term what is the Right. right term well, all, better, all I'm... better better safe than sorry. You know, yeah, that's take, it. Take take precautions. Do what you need to to you know ensure the safety of you and and more so your family and friends. You yeah. know you have to you know as I've been following more along with this, it's just amazing how this thing trickles and spreads. You know, and yeah. and that's that's what's causing it. And while you may not be in that uh, senior. Um, vulnerable population mm-hmm. uh i i am so uh you know ah. that's that's interesting you know interesting thing for me to think about going to blade show even uh next weekend a family wedding in north carolina oh man um and i know you recently canceled a trip to uh to new yeah. york because yeah. of the outbreak yeah so, the past yeah. weekend we were going to go to new york and uh, yeah. have a have a good old time it was going to be my youngest daughter's first trip there so we were excited for that but uh 
in any case, we stayed home, and and one good thing from that is, well, we we all got to get all of our house chores out of the way. So now we're just right. we're just we have free time. So I got a chance to dig back into my knife making. Oh, I thought you were going to say more time for more time for you guys to get on each other's nerves. <laughs> well, in order to stave that off, I got back into my knife making. <laughs> all right. So I had I had some heat treated blades left over. You know, when we started this podcast. I was uh, in. I was doing that as a hobby on weekends, and and this sort of uh, took over that. And so I've I've had a couple of heat treated blades sitting fallow for about a year, and uh, I have all the materials and tools I needed to handle them. So I started putting handles on them, and and just spent the weekend doing that, and it it it, it reignited my my love for it. I'm, I uh, I primarily do stuff with my hands. That's my artistic right. out, but. Uh, Lately, it hasn't been, so it was great yeah. to get back in the in the saddle. Well, it was interesting, uh, again, referring to this past Thursday Night Knives, you actually had uh, one of your friends who you had made a knife for that uh, actually yeah. hopped in the comments uh, when you were when you guys were talking about that. So that was, that was pretty cool, at least for me to watch. I don't know how it was for you on the, <laughs> the receiving end of that. Well, it was, it was shocking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was cool. Uh, he happens to be a, uh, uh, an officer of the law, and I don't know why. Having an officer of the law pop into the show, I mean, Stu's come on, uh, <laughs> right. made me feel like, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> but of course, I was doing nothing wrong. Yeah, I made him a little uh, little boot knife, a little, little boot worn cliff mm -hmm. when he was a motor cop. All right, cool deal. Talking about coronavirus, COVID, we mentioned Blade Show on Thursday Night Knives, you know, some for, some and against, c canceling, but uh, the virus unfortunately is already affecting uh, some shows worldwide, Bob. Yeah, remember uh, we talked about the Iowa show, the Outdoor Classics. It's the it's the huge European outdoor equipment show, and a lot of knife makers, uh, European and American, and you know worldwide show there. Uh, well, they had canceled it initially, and then they uh, just rescheduled it for September, uh, September third through sixth, twenty twenty. And their aim is now to just. Uh, you know, it's always been in March historically. Now that they're moving it to se September for this year, they're going to keep it in September uh, in, in consequent years just to sort of keep it regular. Yeah, and it'll consistent. still be in Nuremberg at their exhibition center uh, in Germany. So it's good to hear that it's not just canceled. You mm -hmm. know, uh, a lot of people rely on these shows to make contacts and to make sales and to keep afloat. Livelihood. Yep. It's nice to hear that they haven't just outright canceled it, but they're optimistically uh, pushing it, pushing it back right. a little. And uh, something about Topps knives? Oh, yeah. I was looking uh, on Instagram, and it seems that Topps has canceled their participation in a number of upcoming shows. I don't know if that includes Blade Show or what, but uh, yeah, they announced it on Instagram. I don't know if it mm. was an announcement as it, it was just sort of an offhanded comment. Uh, in one of the posts I saw, since we're in, since we've canceled all of our upcoming shows, we want to let you know that we're still busting out knives. Mm. And, and another thing I want to mention, I heard an economist talking on the Joe Rogan podcast or, or another podcast about how um, buying goods from uh, other countries and importing goods is not an issue. So if you're concerned about buying and selling knives or especially buying knives, apparently uh, merchandise and receiving merchandise is not much of an issue. However, if you're buying from the secondary market, you still may want to, I don't know, I do this anyway. Whenever I get a new knife, I've always done this. I kind of wipe it down with alcohol before I even touch it. Hmm. You never know who you're getting oh, okay. it from. And I'm, you know, I'm sure right. they're all great guys, but you know, never know what they touched right before they put it in. Again, better safe than sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you have a, if you have a, a legacy of paranoia, such as myself, you'll do things like this. All right. Hey, stay with us. Uh, we've got uh, some stories, some knife life news we're going to get into and uh, hang around. Bob's going to do a first tool segment talking about the Chris. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. It's time now for the latest knife life news. So recently, there's been a lot of talk of the knife called Elvia by Ed Calderon. Ed Calderon is, is a uh, prominent former counter narco agent. Uh, who worked in uh, in the Mexican um, cartel, worked thwarting the Mexican cartels, if you will. And uh, he's got a blog called Ed's Manifesto. It's pretty famous, and he talks about the different things that are happening uh, in cartel-controlled Mexico. And he talks about some of his 
uh, misadventures or whatever you want to call them uh, in being law enforcement down there and survival tactics and stuff like that. Anyway, he's he's had this knife that he's carried as his ultimate backup for years. It's He calls it the Elvia, uh, which is his mother's name. This knife was his mother's all around utility kitchen pairing uh, knife. And it was something that she carried with her and it was something that she used for everything chores around the house, prepping food, this and that. But it also came in handy when they were attacked on the street and she saved her family with this little knife. Uh, and so Ed Calderon has had a number of these uh, made up, a uh, custom version. Uh, recently, we talked about how Emerson Knives is making a folding version of this knife. And uh, now Copus Designs, someone I've reached out to, I'd love to have on the show, uh, John Bolitzis. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. He has come out with a mid-tech version of the Ed Calderon Elvia. It is a fixed-bladed version, and uh, it is an interesting take on the whole mid-tech concept. Usually, uh, designers and makers use mid-tech uh, knives to push out high-end uh, reproductions of even higher-end customs. Well, in this case, this mid-tech version is bringing this to the broader public, making uh, this form factor more affordable. Uh, to people. It's a 154 cm. It's two and a half uh, inches. The blade is sort of a hawk build shaped blade. But the handle is GRN. It's molded GRN and it fits in a uh, in a super slim package. It's like a, a, a Kydex sheath. So really the, the most interesting thing to me is not only this, uh, this very unique sort of Pical uh, setup knife is, is going mainstream, but also that it's coming out in a mid-tech version uh, brought out by John Bolitzis, Bolitzis, at a fraction of the price of what you might expect from a mid-tech knife. John, by the way, is protege of Matt Martin of Vehement Knives. We've, uh, uh, we talked to him on the show, uh, Matt Martin, who makes amazing, amazing fixed blade knives. As a matter of fact, we had, uh, Rob Bixby on the show recently, and he said that he thinks Matt Martin is the, f one of the finest, he said the finest fixed blade maker of his generation these days. So. That's quite a compliment. Anyway, yeah. uh, so look for this uh, Ed Calderon Elvia on Ed's manifesto. Uh, the first uh, version of it sold, the uh, first batch sold really quickly, but they're they're putting a whole another one into production. So sounds cool. Yeah. Moving on with knife life news. Uh, what is it, Bob? Every week we're talking about steel wheel. Yeah, and it's true. And yet this is only the second knife that's coming out from them uh, for 2020 so far. Uh, this is their. It's called the Avior. And it's, let me see, it's the usual D2 G10 steel liners, four and a half ounces. <laughs> you know, it just looks like a steel wheel. It's pretty cool looking, and I bet it's a workhorse. It's got a nice forward finger choil, and they really, really on this one worked hard on the action. Uh, apparently, uh, you can look at it. You can look at where the pivot and the flipper tab are when it's open. And they are thrust quite forward on the handle. And as a matter of fact, the handle even um, reaches forward to accommodate uh, a more forward placement of the pivot and the, and the flipper tab, which makes the action on this thing apparently really, really sweet. Uh, it's got ceramic ball bearing pivots, which is nice for uh, an, a relatively inexpensive knife. Uh, and these things will be coming out March 16th. Now, this is the second one. Like you said, we've talked about a lot of the knives. We've talked a lot about the knives they have in the offing, but this is only the second one to be released uh, behind the Screamer, which is a really cool looking knife. I love that Screamer. Funny name and a little too short for my taste, but cool knife. So that uh, just came out a couple of days ago. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. March 16th. Yeah. March okay. 16th. Yeah. I All think right. this was the, the past weekend. It was actually Monday. Yeah. <laughs> Dates are not your strong suit. No, no, they're not. As a matter of fact, Monday is just the last day of the weekend. <laughs> oh, <Bro. laughs> I like that way. Look at that. I like that. All right, let's talk uh, about more new knives uh, involving Boker. Yep. blade. Yep. Just wanted to bring out uh, the that Boker has two new um, outdoor fixed blades coming out, and one of them is uh, called the Commodore. Commodore with a K. And uh, it's the sequel to the Cormoran, which came out, I believe, last year. It was a, a smaller outdoor fixed blade, uh, both designed by Hungarian knife maker Sandor Hages. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I don't speak Hungarian, but I'm thinking that's how you pronounce his name, who, who's known for his rugged outdoor fixed blades. Now, this uh, Commodore 
is a 7.6 inch drop point blade uh, with a it's a very plain looking knife, I got to say, but it, it looks like uh, all business. It's SK5, uh, which is carbon steel, but it's uh, coated. So it's a slightly less thick than a quarter inch. It's going to it's going to wallop uh, as a chopper. So, yeah, G10 handle scales, full tang. Uh, check out this weight, Jim. 16.76 ounces. So this sucker is a pound, one pound. And just over the limit to ship first class. <laughs> Uh, the second one from them is uh, by storied and much loved Jesper Voxnez, uh, a guy I'd love to interview. He just, just keeps he's he's an interesting guy. Anyway, he's got something coming out called the Nesme Pro, and it's a smaller his version of the Nesmuk. And if you don't know, uh, the Nesmuk is a is a famous outdoor knife pattern. You know, kind of famous with campers and outdoorsmen. So this Nesme Pro is a much smaller um, than usual Nesmuk. It's got it's got a contoured handle, which is a, a little bit unusual, and it's got a D2 uh, bladed steel. It's got canvas micarta, and it'll only be about sixty five bucks or so, which is way less than the previous version of his uh, of his Nesmuk. Uh, just two point six inch blade and two point seven five ounces. So small, light. And if it's from Voxnez, it's going to look cool as hell and feel great in your hand. So, mm-hmm. sounds exciting. And at 65 bucks, uh, pretty affordable. Yeah. Well, speaking of affordable, we're going to talk about a new affordable titanium frame lock folder from Ontario. So That's what's, right. What's their, defi- what's their definition of affordable? Well, they are so famous at Ontario Knife Company in terms of folders for the RAT 1 and RAT 2 models. And, and I mean, just for... Over 10 years, those have been like uh, highly recommended uh, budget conscious EDCs. They're beautifully designed, beautifully executed, and inexpensive, and uh, come in, in a variety of steels. Variety meaning OS8 or D2. Uh, so now they've come out with something new that I imagine they hope will sort of pick up the mantle of the rat, uh, the rat models and kind of push push things upward a little bit. It's called the Shikra. When I first saw it, I thought it was Shakira, the Shikra. And it is an interesting sort of combination of budget and luxe. It's a titanium frame lock micarta handled OS 8 flipper. It's uh, 3.2 inches, uh, the blade. It's, uh, it's a drop point. It's got a nice slender profile. The micarta handle looks beautiful. And, you know, it just seems like a great thing for them to come out with. My one reservation, of course, as you guessed from my, the pregnant pause before I mentioned it, is the OS 8 steel. What's up with OS 8 steel? Ontario Knife Company, you're an American knife company. You're making your knives in America, right? So why not just use an American steel and something that's not such a dog? People don't <laughs> like OS 8. I mean, you know, they like it as much as they like 8CR, and it works, and it's fine, but you can you can now get better steels for similar costs. And and, mm-hmm. and they're saying, Ontario Knife and Tool is saying, what the hell do you know about building knives at cost? You, you have no idea, so shut up, Bob. And that's a good point. However, I must say, if you want to sell these things, how about you put eight, uh, you put like N690 or or D2? How about D2? Just D2. People are doing D2. It's working. So I think it's a great idea for Ontario Knife Company to come out with an inexpensive titanium frame lock folder with micarta. Love it. Mm -hmm. Just put on a steel that's not going to make people raise their eyebrows. I know. OS8 is fine, and I never push it to its limit, but I don't know. It's a little tone deaf at this point. I I think you did a, you know, fairly decent impersonation of Ontario Knife, but uh, would uh, <laughs> go ahead and extend the invitation to Ontario Knife to uh, come on the podcast, talk about this, as well as other great things yes. the company has done, the rat the rat knives and those kind of things. So uh, open yeah. invitation there to Ontario or any other knife maker, uh, knife purveyor to uh, to come on the show. Our uh, Sunday interview show will give you a great platform to do that. So uh, To justify just email- your faulty decisions. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just Bob. kidding. That was, I'm that just was kidding. Bob DeMarco that said that. I'm just kidding, y'all. And you can email him at bob at thenifejunkie.com. <laughs> and now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. 
All right, Bob, uh, kind of good-natured uh, humor there, a little ribbing on you, but uh, seriously, do uh, encourage folks to uh, to email you at bob at com or call our listener line. If you have any questions or comments, we would love to uh, get your feedback and then uh, play those back on the uh, podcast, 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487. That's the number to call to uh, give us your comments, your uh, critiques, your questions. We would definitely love to hear from you and uh, get some conversation uh, conversation going. And uh, speaking of uh, kind of conversation and engagement, one of the neat things last Thursday night on Thursday Night Lives, which is uh, Bob's live YouTube video show, you and your guest co-host traditionally always do a pocket check at the, at the beginning of the show. But uh, this past Thursday just kind of evolved into a pocket check with all the listeners. And I really found that uh, pretty cool that, you know, everybody's throwing up on the comments, you know, what they carried in their pocket. And you and, <laughs> and Alex, the guest co-host last Thursday, had a chance to kind of riff on those a little bit. So uh, I think we're going to be uh, doing the pocket check as a regular thing on Thursday Night Knives. So. Yes, yes. I, I realized uh on that evening that I hadn't done that in a little while. I don't think. So it was so cool to hear people chiming in uh, with what they carried. Half of them were probably lying, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, there were some pretty sweet knives named. I think someone was carrying a Brian Efros. He's a, a new a new knife maker, a relatively new, um, right. that is making some cool stuff. I saw I saw you writing down, you know, it's like, oh, i got to add that one to my collection. Yeah. Oh, i got to add that one to <laughs> yeah. it. How many pages is your is your to buy list now? Uh, it's a short list. As a matter of fact, I oh. try not to keep one. I try not oh. to keep one, though. Though from time to time, I'll make a little list. Okay, all right. <laughs> it's time for some knife history with the first tool here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Chris Jim because I've been talking a lot about the Chris recently with the two releases, uh, the two 2020 Cold Steel releases, the Signature Series Tie Light. Chris and the um, the extra large uh, Voyager Chris. Uh, these models really, you know, I was looking forward to something from Cold Steel in a Chris form, and then they came out with something this year, and so I was very happy. Snatched them both up, uh, but it made me it made me think about Chris's a lot. And uh, you know, when you show the knife to people, they initially uh, frequently will initially assume it's just kind of a novelty there to look cool. And, um, you know, to be scary, but really the, the Chris shape blade has, uh, well, it's been around for a long time and it's had a mystical significance that people are aware of, but it's also a very, very practical weapon. Not, not maybe so much a utility knife, but it is an incredible weapon. So anyway, the, the Chris came out of, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, that area. And uh, they think that it, uh, and Java, I guess, is where it, where it initially sprung up. But they think that it was perhaps a uh, an offshoot of a of a long, wavy bladed glaive like weapon uh, that the Chinese used. You know how everything just kind of, you know, human history is one big long movement. People moving around the planet, and you can really track that when you look at blades. You can see how weapons, especially in the Philippines, uh, were evolved from European, Chinese, African, you know, because they were a maritime uh, culture, so they had all these influences. The Chris is a wavy-bladed sword, uh, which sometimes you'll see in a straight blade. Uh, they think that it comes from the stingray tail, as if to emulate the tail of a stingray, and it frequently will have a handle that's angled off of the blade in such a way that it facilitates sort of a pistol grip or an extension of the forearm. So, um, uh, so that when you're thrusting forward, your hand can take can stay in a natural posture. Okay, so this is the a really interesting thing when I started looking at Chris's. A real Chris, an actual Chris, has to have a a, a rough surface texture because what they were doing was uh, you had to you had to make a Chris from a number of different steels uh, or a number of different metals, and it it would end up rough and grainy and sort of damascene, you know, with swirling patterns, you'd be able to, especially with an acid etch, you'd be able to see the different steels in the blade. And the reason that they are frequently rough and kind of grainy in texture, physical, physical texture, is that um, meteorite was seen as a, a, a critical 
uh, ingredient in the steel. If you could get your hands on some meteorite, which obviously has magical um, qualities to it, and blend it into the steel and fold it into the steel, you would have a better blade. But also it creates what the bladesmiths uh, down there call PAMOR, PAMOR, P-A-M-O-R, uh, which is that sort of patina, that sort of rough, grainy patina. And uh, it's interesting. In the book I was reading, I have a bunch of books on swords, as you may imagine. Uh, one of the books I was reading was saying that uh, many, many a knife collector has destroyed a fine crisp by thinking they needed to polish it, by thinking they oh, got no. some old busted. <laughs> yeah. And, and they polish away the, the, you know, the pammer of the blade. Uh, so an interesting, uh, one of the design qualities of the Chris is how it widens at the base. Uh, so you'll have these sinuous curves and as it gets towards the, uh, the hilt, it widens out into a bunch of symbolic notches and teeth, uh, that are kind of carved into the hilt. It extends, uh, uh, back over the wrist more than it does over the fingers. And these teeth can be used also in a, in a battle-like fashion. If you're, if you're up close, uh, those teeth act as, uh, you know, as weapons in and of themselves. Now, uh, due to how long and how difficult it is to forge in the waves of, of a Chris blade, you will also see a lot of straight bladed Chris's because they were quicker, easier to make. And, uh, you know, take less skill. Different smiths have different skill levels. And if you need a crisp pretty quick because the battle's coming, you're not going to worry too much about about the waves. Uh, but the waves themselves, uh, symbolic of uh, a stingray tail. Also, uh, the number of curves uh, has some symbolism. I know that 13 is a, is a big number with the curves in the Indonesian crisps, but I'm not exactly sure what that means. They also have a very practical uh, application. In a slash, those waves, if you're slashing against someone's flesh with those waves, they act as a serration, uh, as serrations. So it's like uh, the undulations act as serrations like on a bread knife and cut, cut and slash ever deeper. But also on a thrust, the waves have the practical application of widening the wound channel as, as pushed forward, uh, because, because of the waves become ever thicker and wider. It, it has right, that sort of right. uh, grisly sort of effect. Hmm. So a couple of interesting mystical uh, aspects about the Chris. An old Chris, an old well-used Chris, should be raised to the forehead in a, in a salutation. That's part of kind of the Kali salutation. It's to show respect because these things have magical forces in them. At least that's, that's how it's perceived. You're never to point the Chris at anyone, even if it's in the sheath, because it will bring bad luck on that person. Oh, wow. Yeah, it'll project its magic. Hopefully you haven't done that with yours. Well, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I found okay. out something interesting about my Chris. To match the Chris with the user, so if, if someone's going to the Chris store and buying a Chris. Kind of like Harry Potter and the <laughs> wand store. Yes, exactly. You hold the Chris in your hand and you repeat this sort of poem uh, it's kind of like, she loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. She loves me. And if you end on, she loves me not, you put that Chris down and you pick up a different Chris because that is not the Chris for you. Uh, so that's like, it, obviously it's not, she loves me, she loves me not. It's a, it's an ancient Southeast Asian poem, but it kind of has the same effect. Interesting. Now in peacetime, a real man walks around with his Chris all the time, but he leaves it on the right side. And that, that shows that with his right hand, it would make it much more difficult to draw and use it. So, so yes, I'm a man, I'm wearing my crisp, but it's on my right side. That means I'm chill and it's peacetime. But in a confrontation on the street or in battle, you move that over to the left-hand side and it means I mean business. So you're, you're shifting that crisp over to the left. Now it can be easily drawn with your right hand and you can Interesting. go to work. And oftentimes in battle, they would bring two crisses or three crisses. Two meaning one wielded in each hand. The Philippine, especially in the Philippines, they're very good at that sort of two-handed fighting. And then the family, Chris, also with you to bring you good luck and, and magic. In Java, the Chris, which in Java is long and thin and very curvy, is used to ex was used for executions, kind of Roman style. If you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, uh, towards uh, in the beginning. Uh, some treacherous captains are trying to kill uh, the main character, Maximus, and they put him on his knees and they're about to thrust the sword downward 
uh, parallel to the spine between the clavicle and the and the um, shoulder blade, and it goes right into the heart and kills you pretty quick. Well, they would do the same thing in in, in Java uh, using the Chris, except they would put a wad of um, cloth there and thrust through the cloth, and then as they draw it out, wipe the blade oh, off. It's very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty ingenious, yeah. Anyway, this is obviously a brief bullet point um, uh, look at the Chris because it's a very long and interesting and convoluted history because of all the many, many thousands of different islands in Southeast Asia that it resided on in these different archipelagos. So I have a Chris that's been hanging on my wall behind me. If you've ever watched Thursday Night Knives, you've seen it. And in doing this research, I realized it's not a Chris after all. It's called a sundang, and a sundang is a polished bladed sword. So the elements of making the sword are different. Uh, it's a polished blade. The uh, blade is broader, thinner, and uh, has a long portion of straight after the waves. It's got an S-shaped hilt, a tubular handle, and all of these things make it not a Chris. I totally thought I had a Chris mm. for years and years, um, but... Uh, but I have a Sundang, and actually it's a very robust sword, and uh, maybe even, um, I don't know, I don't know, maybe better even than more better? battle-worthy? Who knows? <laughs> Your Sundang is better than a Chris, yes. <laughs> okay, and, and just in wrapping up, I want to reference uh, how I brought this in, the Cold Steel Chris's. Now, if you look at them, the Cold Steel Voyager Chris actually resembles more of a Sundang. It's got a wider, broader blade. And the uh, Tylite version, the one that looks like the Italian switchblade, looks more like an Indonesian Chris. It's more sinuous, it's thinner, and the, and the, and the uh, waves are more dramatic. So I don't know if he intended this, but in, in putting out these two knives, well, Lynn Thompson scratched two itches I didn't know I had. So I'm pretty sure he wasn't intending on that. Well, you never know. The, the, the things you learned in your research uh, maybe were part of the design of those knives, you know, yeah. learning yeah. those little little ancient bits of history. If you're at all interested in the Chris, uh, please take what I've just told you as the cliff notes. Go read a book or look at the, the Wikipedia page. That's pretty uh, in-depth. It is a fascinating history. And that's this week's look at knife history with the first tool. And now back to the Knife Junkie podcast. All right, back on the uh, Knife Junkie podcast, Bob. Again, kudos, compliments. Uh, I, you know, history was an okay subject for me in uh, mm -hmm. high school and college, but uh, it's 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 really good. Just just enough to kind of wet the whistle and wet the appetite, learn some stuff, and uh, maybe uh, entice folks to go learn more about the subject of the first tool. Well, you know, what's kind of interesting, Jim. Is that any area no, of interest? Tell me, <laughs> I will tell you. Any area of interest you have, if it reaches back in time, is a great way to learn about history. You know, just cracking a history book didn't didn't interest me ever. But learning about history through art, or learning through history, uh, learning about history through weapons, did. So maybe that's a good way to do it. Hey, if you are enjoying the uh, Knife Junkie podcast, the the midweek show where Bob gets a chance to uh, dive deep into some of the knife topics or the Sunday interview show where Bob uh, chats with knife makers, YouTube uh, knife reviewers, other folks in the knife world, we would appreciate your support and it doesn't cost you anything. If you're going to be shopping online and buying stuff from Amazon and eBay anyway, just use our affiliate link and we'll earn a very small commission, but it does not affect the price that you pay. So go to thenifejunkie.com slash shop Amazon or thenifejunkie.com slash shop eBay. That's thenifejunkie.com slash shop Amazon or thenifejunkie.com slash shop eBay. And we'll receive a very small commission on your purchase, but it does uh, help us pay some of our fees, uh, hosting, website hosting, media hosting, and uh, all those other kind of good things. So uh, we appreciate your support. Bob, as we uh, wrap up the midweek supplemental episode, uh, final thoughts, uh, anything uh, to, to kind of wrap up the show here? Could be about knives, could be life in general, or what's going on in the world. As you know, I give you the final word. So what's going on? Well, Jim, I'm uh, if, since we talked a little bit about the wider world today, I'm just glad I went through my paranoia phase a few years back and stocked up on all this stuff when I thought the world was ending uh, before. <laughs> so, so you know, everybody take this seriously and take good care of yourselves. And, uh, you know, we, we got knives to take care of. So, I mean, right. I'm sorry. We've got family and people <laughs> to take care of. So, 
take care of yourself, too. I, I think you probably spoke correctly there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie person. want to say thank you so much for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast, and be sure, wash your hands frequently. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.